Hello, my name is Brad Duncan, and I am a Threat Intelligence Analyst with Palo Alto Networks Unit 42. And this is the fourth video of the Palo Alto Networks Unit 42 Wireshark Workshop. If you're watching this video, you should already have reviewed the first three videos, parts one through three of this workshop series. As a reminder, packet captures of the traffic and PDF files of the slides are available at github.com pan-unit42 slash wireshark-workshop. The PCAPs and PDFs are contained in zip archives and these zip archives are all password protected with the string unit42. All one word with lowercase letters. In order to understand malicious traffic, you must first understand what non-malicious and normal traffic looks like. Back when I first started out, the most common question that I had was why is this activity that I'm looking at, why is it not malicious? At that time, various types of traffic generated on Windows hosts looked unusual to me. Why? It's because I did not yet understand a lot of what I was looking at. Routine web browsing, operating system activity for Microsoft Windows, and legitimate applications, these can all generate traffic that looks unusual if you have never seen it before. With that in mind, this fourth Wireshark workshop video is going to review various types of non-malicious activity that security professionals may run across when reviewing PCAPs of network traffic. This is the Xubuntu environment I used in the previous three videos. So let's go to the GitHub page for our Wireshark workshop to download the PCAPs for this video. For part four, I had to split the PCAPs into two separate zip archives because all of the PCAPs in a single zip archive made the file too large for me to upload to GitHub. So we have two zip archives. Workshop part 04 PCAPs part 1.zip and workshop 04 PCAPs part 2 zip. We'll download the first one. And then we'll download the second one. Remember, unit 42 is the password, and I'm going to extract the files. I'm going to copy all of the files and put them in the same folder. So now, all of the PCAPs for this video are in the same folder. In the first PCAP for this video, we are pretending that we received an alert for Windows malware from an IP address at 10.2.4.101. This PCAP matches the time in the internal IP address of the alert. However, traffic from 10.2.4.101 in this PCAP indicates it is not a Windows host. And after we establish this host is not running Windows, we can resolve the alert and move on to other things. So let's open our first PCAP. And let's use our basic web filter. Here we see domains and URLs that indicate this host is running Fedora Linux. And the alert shows a TCP port of 55358. So if we find that port in our column display and follow the TCP stream, the user agent line in the HTTP request headers also indicates this is Fedora Linux. Our next four PCAPs cover traffic generated by a Windows 10 host.
For the PCAPs in this workshop, I've disabled as much telemetry and other Windows traffic that I could through various system settings without disabling Windows Update or Microsoft's antivirus updates. But this still leaves a variety of traffic to various domains owned or controlled by Microsoft. Our second PCAP is the first three minutes of a standalone Windows host after it boots up. So let's open our second PCAP. Without any filtering, we can see DHCP traffic in the first four frames after this Windows host has powered on. Our basic web filter shows 152 frames in the column display to various Microsoft related domains. If we scroll to the end, we can see some certificate related domains. And we can see a Google domain. We can filter on DNS and take a look at the DNS queries. We can filter on UDP traffic without DNS. UDP and not DNS. We can filter on non-IP traffic and we can see some of the ARP probes. So not IP. And there's some of the ARP probes. But let's go back to our basic web filter. I'm going to hide the source. I'm going to hide the source port. And show the host name. Now, pause this video and take some time to review the domains, URLs, and IP addresses of this non-malicious traffic, just so you can get a little more familiar with non-malicious Windows 10 activity. Windows 10 occasionally retrieves images used by the Microsoft Store and various other system applications. These images are sent by the domain store-images.s-microsoft.com. That top-level domain, s-microsoft.com, is a legitimate domain used by Microsoft. So let's open our third PCAP and use our basic web filter. We'll just close our second PCAP and open our third PCAP and use the basic web filter. We can see HTTP URLs to store-images.s-microsoft.com for several images. Follow any of the TCP streams. I'm going to pick the first one and you should find indicators that are indeed image files. So I'm picking the first frame I'm following the TCP stream. And we can see, for example, the content type in the HTTP response headers shows image slash JPEG. And we can see other indicators like the string JFIF in all caps here. And if you scroll down and you look through this, you get a general sense of what an image file actually looks like. These should be JPEG images. And interesting to note, in the HTTP request headers, there is no user agent string for traffic retrieving these images. And that is unusual for most HTTP traffic because you almost always see a user agent string in the HTTP request headers. However, no user agent string is normal for this specific activity. We can also export the files. Go File, Export Objects, HTTP. And we'll see a list of various images sent by store-images.s-microsoft.com. I'm going to pick the first image and I'm going to save it. I'm going to just name it temp1.jpg or .jpg. I can double click the file and then view it. Mine is opening with Firefox. 
And here is one of the images that was downloaded. Zoom in a little bit here. This is an example of an image that is retrieved to be shown in the Microsoft Store. Connecting a USB device like a thumb drive to your Windows 10 host causes traffic to go.microsoft.com and dmd.metaservices.microsoft.com. This type of traffic is not limited to USB devices, but it contains metadata about devices used by the Windows 10 host. I usually remove this traffic from the PCAPs that I share because this metadata is sent over non-encrypted HTTP traffic, and I prefer not to share such details publicly. So let's open our fourth PCAP and use our basic web filter. We go back to the desktop. I'm going to close this web browser. I'm going to close this PCAP, and we'll open the fourth one. Here we see two HTTP POST requests to the two domains, go.microsoft.com and dmd.metaservices.microsoft.com. The first HTTP request redirects to the other domain, so these come in pairs. For each request to go.microsoft.com, you should see another request immediately after that to dmd.metaservices.microsoft.com. Let's follow the TCP stream for the request to go.microsoft.com. The user agent line in the, HTTP in the HTTP request headers shows Microsoft Device Metadata Retrieval Client. And it is sending metadata about the USB thumb drive like the hardware ID that I connected to this Windows 10 host. And scroll down. You can see various information here. So it's redirecting here. Each request like this to go.microsoft.com will generate another request to dmd.metaservices.microsoft.com. Go back to our basic web filter and I'm going to follow the TCP stream to dmd.metaservices.microsoft.com. Here we see the same data being posted. This time we see a 200 OK in the HTTP response headers from the server, sending data formatted back in a similar XML format. Swarm is a protocol used to deliver Windows updates from other Windows computers. I believe this is enabled by default for Windows hosts on the same internal network. This causes TCP traffic over port 7680 between Windows clients in the same LAN. Our fifth PCAP has a short example of this traffic. So let's open this fifth PCAP. I'm going to close what we had open here in our fourth PCAP. Open our fifth PCAP. We use our basic plus filter. With this filter, I'm also showing the source IP, source port, destination IP, and destination port. We can see two TCP SYN segments here that represent the start of two TCP streams. Here, we see two source IP addresses, 10.7.5.135 and 10.7.5.133, sending traffic over TCP port 7680 to 10.7.5.136. So let's follow that first TCP stream. There's not much data here, but we can see a string that states swarm protocol in the traffic. It is coming from both the sender and the receiver. I'm 
These TCP connections will stay active indefinitely, and data from Windows system or app updates would eventually be sent through these channels. For traffic caused by web browsers, we'll examine network activity from Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, and Firefox. We'll also review an example of DNS over HTTPS. First, let's open our sixth PCAP. I will close our fifth PCAP and open the sixth PCAP. Now I want to filter on DNS. Here we can see three DNS queries to random strings of letters ending in .local domain. This one, this one, and this one. I can filter on this a little more specifically by doing DNS query name contains local domain. Here we have a better look. If we filter on NBNS, we can see these same three random strings. So let's do that. And here they are, they're in all caps. Now, why do we see this NBNS traffic? That's because if a DNS query does not resolve or get a response from a DNS server, Windows will try the same name query over in BNS. So let's go back to our DNS query using local domain. This traffic is caused by Google Chrome and the newer version of Microsoft Edge, the one that shares Chrome's code base. They are random queries representing non-existent domains. This is how Chrome and Edge make sure that your internet service provider is not redirecting any traffic for non-existent domains. These queries should not resolve, which is what happens in our PCAP, or if we do get a response, it should be in X domain. Let's go back to our basic web filter. I'm going to hide the source IP address. I'm going to hide the source port, and I'm going to show the host column. Scroll down just a tad. Here we see HTTP request to domains ending in .gvt1.com. gvt1.com is a domain used by Google to send updates for Google Chrome. We also see this with Microsoft Edge, and that's what we'll have in our seventh PCAP. So let's open our seventh PCAP and let's use the same basic web filter. And what I've done here is I have carved this down to a very small file only containing part of the traffic. That's because if I included the entire Microsoft Edge update, it would be a very, very big PCAP. So I have a small PCAP here that shows that Microsoft Edge also uses domains ending in .gvt1.com to update Microsoft Edge. Edge also causes the same type of DNS queries that we see from Chrome, even though I did not include that DNS activity in our seventh PCAP. Let's look at our eighth PCAP for traffic generated by the Firefox web browser. We'll close the seventh PCAP and We'll open the 8th PCAP and use our basic web filter. Firefox generates traffic to various domains ending in Firefox.com, Mozilla.com, and Mozilla.net. I'm not going to waste any time on this, so feel free to review this PCAP at your leisure. Chrome Edge and Firefox now have DNS over HTTPS enabled by default if you are using it on a standalone host like a home computer. In an enterprise environment, this function is normally disabled, but we need to recognize DNS over HTTPS traffic if we run across it in a PCAP. Firefox uses Cloudflare as its default provider for DNS over HTTPS, and our ninth PCAP has an example of this. So let's close our eighth PCAP, and we will open our ninth PCAP. 
for our filter, let's use the basic plus DNS filter. Here we see an initial DNS query to mozilla.cloudflare-dns.com. That is the provider. After that, we see no more DNS queries, but we do see some HTTPS traffic to mozilla.cloudflare-dns.com. We see that four times here. One, two, three, four. We also see HTTPS traffic to four other domains. Normally, we would see DNS queries for each of those domains before the TCP SYN segments kick off that HTTPS traffic. In this case, where we would otherwise see a DNS query for those domains, instead we now see HTTPS traffic to mozilla.cloudflare-dns.com, which is where the DNS queries are being tunneled through HTTPS traffic. And this is an example of DNS over HTTPS as implemented in Firefox. Many applications that you install on a Windows host will automatically check for and install updates. There are too many applications to include PCAPs with their update traffic for this Wireshark workshop. So we have included one example of update traffic for Adobe Reader on a Windows 10 host, and that is our 10th PCAP. So let's close our 9th PCAP and open our 10th PCAP. Use our basic web filter. Adobe Reader updates are provided through the domain ardownload.adobe.com. You can review this on your own if you need to, but let's move on. Our 11th PCAP is an example of IRC traffic generated using IceChat version 9.5 on a Windows 10 host. Using IceChat, I connected to irc.dal.net and joined a Chataholics chat room. This chat room has a bot that continuously runs a trivia quiz. Here is what the IceChat client looked like on a Windows 10 host that was used to generate our 11th PCAP. Now let's close our 10th PCAP and open our 11th PCAP. Use the basic plus DNS filter. Follow the TCP stream for traffic going to 143.244.23.1 over TCP port 6667. It should be the last frame in the column display. You could also filter on IRC to quickly check for unencrypted IRC traffic. Here we can see HTTPS traffic to iChat.net, but more important is the DNS query to irc.dal.net, and it's followed by a TCP SYN segment over TCP port 6667. Follow that TCP stream. I'm going to widen this. I used my name as the nickname in this chat room, and you can see the public IP address that I was coming from. Now I changed that IP address when I sanitized this PCAP for the workshop, so this is not the actual IP address that I came from. When you scroll down, you can see where the botnet is running the trivia quiz, and you can see where I answered correctly and the bot gave me points. Right before I left the Chataholics chat room, I was up to 44 points on the trivia quiz. This trivia quiz that is continually run by the bot. Now, as I already mentioned, you can do a quick filter check 
As I already mentioned, you can do a quick check for IRC by filtering on IRC. We won't see the contents of this traffic by looking in the info column, but we can do a quick check and see if there's actual IRC traffic unencrypted in the PCAP. Most legitimate IRC traffic, though, is encrypted by default. Personally, I've only run across one malware sample, probably about three years ago, that used IRC for command and control, otherwise known as C2 traffic. IRC-based C2 traffic does not seem very common in recent years. I say this because I do not encounter it in my day-to-day -day research where my focus is on mass distribution commodity malware. Our 12th PCAP is an example of legitimate FTP traffic. It was generated using FileZilla. I connected to ftp.adobe.com and retrieved a text file named license.txt. Here is what the FileZilla client looked like on the Windows 10 host when retrieving license.txt from ftp.adobe.com. So let's open our 12th PCAP and use the basic plus DNS filter. I'm going to close our 11th PCAP and open our 12th PCAP and use the basic plus DNS filter. We see a DNS query for ftp.adobe.com and then traffic to the IP used for ftp.adobe.com. Traffic to TCP port 21 is the FTP control channel. Traffic to the other higher numbered TCP ports, the ephemeral ports, represent the FTP data channel. Follow the TCP stream for the first SYN segment to TCP port 21. This shows an anonymous user logging in. And then near the end, you see a list, which will list the directory of that FTP server. Let's go back to our basic plus DNS filter and then follow the TCP stream for the next SYN segment with the destination port of 21637. Traffic through this FTP data channel shows a directory list from the FTP server. Let's go back to our basic plus DNS filter and follow the TCP stream to the second SYN segment that goes to TCP port 21. This shows the user retrieving a file named license.txt. If we go back to our basic plus DNS web filter and follow the TCP stream for the last SYN segment, this is the FTP data channel and it shows the contents of that file license.txt. Use the following Wireshark filter to view the chain of events in the column display. ftp.request.command or ftp-data. So I'm going to clear our filter now. ftp.request.command or ftp-data. I'm going to list out all the way. Here we see in our info column a list of the FTP commands and the FTP data generated by those FTP commands. This is legitimate traffic, but what you may be asking is an example of malware that uses FTP. There is a malware called Agent Tesla that has used FTP to send data from its infected Windows hosts to an FTP server established specifically for that malware. Our next three PCAPs are examples of email traffic.
The 13th and 14th BCAPs are examples of Gmail and Outlook email accounts with mail clients on Windows 10 hosts. Our 15th PCAP is an example of unsecure email where we can actually see some of the email commands and email traffic. Most email is encrypted, as we will see with our Gmail and Outlook examples. You shouldn't see email traffic to and from an external IP address in your enterprise environment. That is, unless a mail client is set up to use something like Gmail or Outlook. If you do see email traffic going to an external IP that resolves to an unfamiliar name for a mail server, then that might be malicious activity. A Wireshark filter to check for unsecure email traffic is IMAP or POP or SMTP. Our 13th PCAP is an example of someone using Gmail through the Thunderbird email client. So let's open our 13th PCAP and let's use our basic plus DNS filter. I'll close our 12th PCAP, open our 13th PCAP, and use the basic plus DNS filter. Here we see DNS queries for imap.gmail.com and smtp.gmail.com. There is also encrypted traffic to these two domains over TCP port 993 for IMAP and TCP port 465 for SMTP. But that IMAP and SMTP traffic is all encrypted, so we cannot see or find any of the email commands in those TCP streams. You can also filter on IMAP or POP or SMTP, but you won't find anything other than what we're seeing here using our basic web filter. Allow me to demonstrate. IMAP or POP or SMTP. Nothing. Our 14th PCAP is an example of an Outlook email account set up through Microsoft Office Outlook 2019. Let's open our 14th PCAP and use the basic web filter. This looks even less like email traffic since these domains do not use email specific strings other than the word Outlook. Furthermore, it's all going through TCP port 443, so this doesn't appear any different than HTTPS web traffic. If you use a basic plus or basic plus DNS filters, you won't find anything email specific except for the use of Outlook in the associated domains. If we filter on IMAP or POP or SMTP, we also find nothing. Our 15th PCAP is an email account from a mail server at swinefactory.com using the Thunderbird email client. This was set up as insecure as possible. So let's open up our 15th PCAP and use the basic plus DNS filter. Here we see DNS queries for mail Dot swinefactory.com. We also see traffic to IP addresses for mail.swinefactory.com for SMTP over TCP port 587 and POP over TCP port 110. This PCAP has SMTP traffic that is encrypted after a connection to the mail server is established. It also has unencrypted POP traffic. We'll look at the POP traffic later. First, let's look at SMTP. Here we see some commands to connect to the mail server before a TLS encrypted pipeline is established. 
If we follow the TCP stream, we can get a better idea of what this all looks like. So in this example, we see some SMTP traffic, but no actual SMTP data. However, the POP traffic is fully unencrypted. If we filter on POP, we can see some of this information in our information column. So we can see here, lots of data. If we want to follow the two TCP streams, we should filter on the POP port, TCP port 110, and the TCP send flags as shown in the filter in this slide. The results should be two TCP SYN segments for streams that you can follow and see some emails. So let's do this. Let's follow the very first result, the TCP stream of the first frame. And we can see where the user is authorized to log in. It's a plain login, which means none of this information is encrypted. This here is a base64 string that represents unencrypted login data. So I'm going to copy this and I'm going to the Cyberchef website and I'm going to decrypt this. When I decrypt this base64 string, I see an email address of Marcus Donegan at swinefactory.com and this password right here. Let's go back to the TCP stream. We can scroll down a little bit. We can see that there are seven emails and the seventh one is being retrieved in this TCP stream, in this POP traffic. We scroll down even farther. There's a lot of information in the, in the mail headers. We can see the message. So I can actually read the messages for Marcus Donegan at swinefactory.com. If we go back, we can look at the next TCP stream, the second send segment when we filter for the TCP streams in our POP traffic. If I scroll down now, we'll see there are eight messages with the eighth one being retrieved in this TCP stream for the POP traffic. And scroll down, there are a lot, there is, is a lot of information in these email headers. And here's another email. We could read this email. This represents the danger of using unencrypted email traffic because if anyone can somehow sniff the traffic that is being sent, they can capture that traffic, they can have access to your email address and your password used to log into your email account, and they could have access to all of your emails. Our 16th PCAP is an example of a file transfer over SMB. This traffic was recorded from an Active Directory environment with a fake domain named studiosolutions.info. The domain controller is at 172.16.1.12 and the Windows client is at 172.16.102. The domain controller has a shared folder that is mapped to the Windows client's Z drive. In this PCAP, someone merely dragged a file named 2021-calendar-blank.xlsx from their Z drive to their desktop. Now let's open our 16th PCAP. We're not going to filter on anything. The first thing we're going to do is export our SMB objects. We go File, Export Objects, SMB. And now we have an Export 
SMB object list. We want to export the very last object in this SMB object list. You'll see there are two entries near the bottom. Both of them are for 2021-calendar-blank.xlsx, but the first one shows in the content type column 25%. That's only 25% of the file that was transferred. The second one shows 100%, and that's the one that we want. So I'm going to save that, and we'll take away the very first backslash character. I'll save that. I'm going to close this and this frame that was selected when I exported that particular object, I'm going to follow the TCP stream. And I'm not going to look at the text, the ASCII representation. I'm going to look in the information column and scroll up a little bit. And we can see in the info column where it transferred the file. This file that I exported from the PCAP is an actual Excel file. Unfortunately, in this particular Exubuntu desktop, I did not install any applications where I could open it. However, I can do a quick file check. And I can see, using the file command in a terminal window, that this shows up as a Microsoft Excel document. Our 17th PCAP contains Tor traffic generated by using the Tor web browser. It contains HTTPS traffic to random domain names over TCP ports 8080 and 8443. Let's open that final 17th PCAP. If we use our basic web filter, we only see traffic over TCP port 8443. But if we use our basic plus or basic plus DNS filter, we see activity over TCP port 8080. In my case, and possibly your case as well, Wireshark automatically decodes traffic over TCP port 8080 as HTTP instead of TLS encrypted traffic like HTTPS. So we have to decode the traffic to TCP port 8080 as TLS in Wireshark. How do we do this? We go to the decode menu. Analyze decode as. So I'm going to add an entry for TCP port value as 8080 and I'm going to select the current decoding as TLS. If I click OK, this will only decode TCP port 8080 as TLS for this specific Wireshark session. If I close Wireshark and open it again, I will no longer have this specific decode entry. If I click Save, this will be saved even if I close and open Wireshark again. I would have to delete this decode entry to see unencrypted HTTP traffic over TCP port 8080 in Wireshark. So I'm going to click OK. I'll go back to my basic web filter. And now I see two more results in my column display. Notice how the domain names are www.randomalphanumericstrings.com. There are no associated DNS queries for these names seen in the host column when we review Tor traffic. I sometimes see malware that uses Tor for command and control traffic, but it's not common. Some ransomware might provide instructions to view a .onion domain, and they may require you to use a Tor browser to communicate to that onion domain with the ransomware criminals.
understand that Tor traffic by itself is not inherently malicious. You should understand what it looks like, though, in case you run across it during an investigation. And most importantly, Tor traffic can use any TCP port. And that concludes the fourth video of the Palo Alto Networks Unit 42 Wireshark Workshop. We reviewed operating system traffic, traffic generated by web browsers, application updates, IRC traffic, FTP traffic, email traffic, file transfers over SMB, and we looked at an example of Tor traffic. We just covered a lot of ground, so thank you for watching. Our next Wireshark Workshop video is Part 5, Introduction to Malware Infections, where we finally start looking at malware infection traffic.